alive. It is the reason why we sing, why we shout, why we celebrate, why we do everything that we do because you live, you reign in our hearts in this place. And God, we just thank you for what you want to do in this place this morning. God, we thank you that, that you still change hearts, that you still change lives, that you still heal, that you still reconcile. And we just praise you for all of that. In Jesus' my name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat if you're not already. Happy Easter, everybody. All right. Nice to see all of you here this morning. Just really glad that you guys are here with us and I uh, hope that you got your fill at the Easter breakfast. I uh, just want to say a huge thank you to everybody who came out as well as to all who participated in the Living Lord's Supper. And uh, they did a great job, didn't they? All those guys and 
And uh, just thank you so much. And, and uh, just there was just a, a really powerful time this weekend. And so thank you for those of you guys who supported us on that. Uh, if you're here with us for the first time, you picked a good Sunday to come, Easter Sunday. So we're glad that you're here. And uh, we have a communication card. It looks like this. It's, it's located right in the pew in front of you. So if you're here for the first time with us or if it's been a while since you've been able to be with us, uh, please fill one of these out. And the offering is going to come by here in a little bit. And then you can just stick that right in the plate. Let us know that you were here with us. And, and uh, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, a few announcements I have for you this morning. Uh, first of all, being that it's Easter, there are no uh, evening services, uh, no prayer service, nor Element 26 tonight. So uh, please spend the time with your family and just uh, enjoy the holiday with each other. Uh, we have our college service, our Connect, uh, which is uh, next Friday, or this Friday, I guess April 5th. And uh, so if you know somebody who has graduated high school who is in that young adult, you know, kind of 18 to 25 range, uh, please tell them about Connect. We have cards out in the foyer that you can uh, invite them with. There's a free hot meal, and if you know college students, like I know college students, you know they like to eat. So tell them, listen, there's a free meal plus Jesus, so you need to come. Um, <laughs> and the college students said amen. Um, the Fusion Kids are doing a pizza and movie night, again, free, so if you know somebody in that age range, uh, kindergarten to sixth grade, that's April 12th from 6.30 to 9. Uh, you can uh, hit up uh, Pastor Dave or Miss Brooke for more details on that. And our Silver Saints, uh, are going to be having a taco night at Tower Pizza um, on April 18th, which is a Thursday. So there's stuff going on for every age group. So, you know, we're glad that you're here. hope that you guys can get plugged in uh, to whichever age group that, uh, that you fit into. And um, also, we want to let you know that uh, our experience groups uh, that happen at 9 a.m. on Sunday, we are not going to be having them for the month of April. Every three months, we take a, just a short break just to kind of revamp and and make sure we have enough teachers and stuff. So we do three months on, one month off. So April will be our, our off month. Um, so, and we'll start those back up then again in May. So that's all I have for you this morning. All right. I will not make the same mistake. I will not say Merry Christmas like I did the other night. <laughs> it is Happy Easter. And so we are glad that you're here today. My name is Pastor Keith, pastor here at Bethel, and I just want to take the time just to thank you for choosing to celebrate with us today our risen Savior. We invite you at any point in time in this service just to make yourself at home. We invite you to participate in any which way that you feel comfortable. If you feel comfortable standing up and jumping around and shouting like some of them do, feel free to. If you don't, then you're free to do that as well. If you, the, anytime during the service, the altar is open. If you want to come up and dance before the Lord, please, be, please, please feel free to do so. If you feel called and compelled to come and just bow yourself before the Lord and call upon his name by putting your face to the ground, just seeking his face at the altar, please feel free to do so. But the one caveat that we'd always say is always be mindful of those who are around you, that your expression of worship and praise and your exuberance and vivacity for our risen Savior doesn't detract from somebody else's worship. All right? So always be conscientious of those who are around you. And at any point in time during the service, if you'd like to have prayer for something, we're going to be having people, our prayer team will be in the corners of the sanctuary. And if at any point in time you say, you know what, I really just have this heavy burden upon my heart that I'd like somebody to pray with me about, please just go to the corners or raise your hand or get your attention, and they will come to you or you go to them, and they would like to agree with you in prayer for the miraculous because we serve a living Savior. Amen. <laughs> Amen. With that, I'm going to ask the ushers they would come and prepare to, uh, prepare to serve this morning. And if you're our guest this morning, we give you permission not to give. If this is your first time with us, this is something that we do every week to allow the people that attend here regularly to support this church and this ministry. And if you're our guest, you are a guest, and we're not asking you to do so. So please do not feel pressured or coerced. And it's okay for you to, uh, to let, that, let that plate slide on by, and the usher's not going to give you a dirty look. He's not going to, you know, tap, hey, you know, do, do one of those things. And uh, uh, he's not even going to acknowledge it whatsoever, you know, so that's between you and the Lord. But please be our guest today, and don't feel pressured to do so. With that, I'm going to just share a call to worship here. And after, with that, we're going to worship in, in, in giving and worship in song together. And basically it is this, Matthew chapter 28, verse 5. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. And verse 6, He is not here. He has risen. 
and our Lord is risen, and risen indeed is he. And so my friends today, would we also rise? If you are able or willing, would we rise together, and would we worship through our giving? Would we worship in our song? Would we worship through the fruit of our lips today? And may we celebrate our risen Savior. Father, I thank you for these people today. I thank you that we serve a risen Lord. And Father, I pray that right now that our praise and our worship and our giving would, exa- would, would, would honor you today in the way that honors you as the living Lord of all the universe. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let us rise, church. Oh, Father God, right now we, we bring ourselves before you, Lord. We humbly come as your servants, Lord Jesus. We lay everything that we have at your feet, Lord God. We serve a risen King, Lord, and we thank you for all that you've done in our lives. My Savior lives.
every know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what He did. My Savior, my Savior lives. Every day a brand new chance to sing, Jesus, you are the only way. My Savior, my Savior lives. I know that my Redeemer lives, stand on what he did my savior my savior lives every day a brand new church you sing because you are the only one my savior my savior lives hallelujah raise your voice if your savior lives this morning Give him praise, church. You are worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. God above all the world in motion. God above all my hopes and fears. I don't care what the world throws at me now. It's gonna be alright, yeah. Hear the sounds of the generations making loud their freedom song. Salvation is 
Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
I saw him, death with his mighty sting, exhaling in every breath the plight he brings. To the grave he gave victory, triumphing over life with the fear of endless sleep. Endlessly, we hide from our mortality. Mortally wounded from birth, we lie to ourselves from infancy. Infinitely investing time in a life that will inevitably be taken by this incredible creature that now stands before me. Death. He manifests himself on ordinary days. His six-foot stomach growls with hunger pains. For his meal, he cannot wait. So we are forced to taste him even before the grave. We are all dying. There is no other way. I see him in Haitian and Japanese earthquakes. He's hating the escapees of his cruel wakes. I see him in poverty, impoverishing the quality of life for regions that are reachable. And in those with the reach who find reason not to reach out to treat what is treatable. I see him in disease, taking life out of uninfected yet affected families. I see him in oppression, pressing down on the oppressed and the oppressor. I see him in depression, in Prozac and pain pills and razor blades and bedside wills. I see him in spiritual confusion, material obsessions, physical possessions. I see him in marital transgressions, childhood remorse from an ugly divorce. I see him in our slavery to appearances, appearing to care more about our images than those in dying villages. I see him in our ignorance, ignoring truth for some comfortable inference. I see his emergence in our churches as we pull out emergency verses as deterrence to religious differences, going on in defense, defending our way of worship, making community worthless. Death is killing us before we even enter the surface of the earth. We are in service of his words. It is finished. The end of our birth. We cannot hide from his wretched curse. For death in his grave we constantly rehearse. Even God himself was coerced. Divinity immersed itself in humanity, humbly taking on flesh, scorning vanity. The world saw his way of life as insanity, insisting he cease speaking of this radical Christianity. But man found him guilty, accusing God of blasphemy, performing the ultimate usurpation by slaying Christ on Calvary. But through their cowardly cross, Jesus embossed mankind with amnesty, championing over death with the beauty of his fatal injury. But I know, many still doubt, and rightfully so, bringing up this inquiry. What does that poor Jewish man dying on a Roman tree 2,000 years ago have to do with me? Well, I reply simply, Christ came and died to marry his bride-to-be. Though death could kill the groom, he could not kill the ring. God made us one with Christ in life and matrimonies cling. And now the undying church, his ever-living wife, can sing. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? For we have risen above your misery. We will not succumb to your finality. We have overcome your infinite mystery in the infinite reign of Christ's ministry. For we are the resurrection, the insurrection of fatality. We are the risen deity, the intersection of a dead yet living body. We live through imperfections where we die to become holy. We cannot be contained by the mouth of the grave. We are the willing slaves of the one who rose from that garden cave. We pass from death to new birth. We gave the grave to the earth. And we claim today the cross is worth the body of his rising. And we are the risen church.
lift your voices, church. We're so glad that we serve a risen Savior. We give you glory and honor and praise. That in you that we truly have victory. That all the cares and the concerns and the troubles of this life and all the tragedies that are around us, the Father in you that there is victory. And I give you glory and honor and praise. And I thank you for that knowledge today that you are the risen Savior. And I pray that that knowledge would resonate in every person's heart and in mind this morning and they would be encouraged and they'd be changed and they would know the victory that can come only from knowing you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody says, amen. amen. Tell your neighbor that he is risen as you find a place to be seated. Yeah, please move everything out of the way. Can you move those? Uh, I want to thank you for being here this morning and just um, I pray that the knowledge of the risen Savior really does become real in your life today. And as we look this morning, just for the next few moments, we're going to look at a question that as a young person, I won't say haunted me, but it was a question that I did not have a, an appropriate answer for. And that question was, why the resurrection? You know, the Easter story is such a dramatic story. It is, it takes you through every corner of your emotional existence. We have the, you know, we have the suspense. And we just had that suspense, you know, on, you know, at the, at the Lord's Supper, you know, when, when Jesus is announcing to the twelve that, you know, that, that somebody's going to betray him. Then we have the intense drama of Jesus, you know, trial. We have the horror of his crucifixion. Then we are overwhelmed with the despondency of his death. Only then to be confronted with the joy of Easter Sunday, with the knowledge that our Lord is risen. See, I always found it quite easy to understand Good Friday. I always found it very easy to understand 
Jesus dying on a cross. I could, I could grasp very easily why Jesus had to die. You know, the Bible says in very plain language that everyone has sinned against God, that we've all missed his standard of perfection. And you know what? Even at a young age, I could simply look at myself and look at my own life, and I could know that that was true. And I believe this morning that everybody in this room, if we're honest, even though we may not admit it, I believe that everybody in this room, when we stop and we look at our lives, and we look at the things that we've done in our lives, every one of us knows that that is true also. That we have missed God's standard of perfection. We don't like to readily admit it, but we have. And the Bible says that the payment for my missing God's standard or, God, or missing God's mark of perfection, he says that the payment for that is death. That without the shedding of blood, that there is no forgiveness of sin. That in other words, for, for my missing God's standard, in order the penalty for the wage that I have to pay for that is for me to shed my own blood. I can understand that. Or somebody had to die for me. But the problem was that everybody who loves me the most, my mom and my dad, my brother and my sister, my grandparents while they were still living, my wife, my son, the problem is that they couldn't die for me because they have the same problem that I do. And that is why Jesus, the incarnate God, came to this earth and lived that perfect life so that he could die in our place and he would taste death for us so that we would not have to. He would come and he would bear the punishment of our sin. And such a horrific story as Good Friday is good news after all, that Jesus died for my sin so that I would not have to. And that is good news. My friends, as a young man, as a young kid, you know, in my early teens, and as a young, you know, even preteen, as I contemplated, I could understand that. I could grasp that. I could see my need for that. And I was thankful that Jesus did it. But the one thing I didn't quite understand was Easter Sunday. Now, I understood that Jesus was alive, and I understood that that was good news because we all know that somebody being, de being alive is better than them being dead. You know, and being alive is something to celebrate. And I, under I understood that, but I didn't understand the necessity of Easter Sunday. Because if the penalty of our sins was death, and that there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Then my sins were taken care of on Good Friday. That my sins were paid for. The punishment was paid for. It was all taken care of on Good Friday. And I question, then what was the purpose and what's the reason? What is the need of Sunday? If everything happened that was good happened on Friday, then what was the need of Sunday? Rather than him being alive and we can have Easter egg hunts and have parties and have an Easter breakfast and sunrise services and all these things, what is the purpose behind it? And as a young person, I never grasped it. Why the need of Easter Sunday? Why the need for the disciples to run to the tomb and to find the stone rolled away and for the angel to say, I know whom you look for, but he is not here, for he has risen. So would Good Friday still be good news without Sunday morning? And I've come to understand that no, the Good Friday is not good news without Sunday morning. So this morning, we're just going to look real quickly here on why the necessity of the resurrection. Point A is this in your notes. Is this. The resurrection 
validates what Christ has accomplished. I want to read from you from the book of Romans chapter 4, verse 25. And this is what it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. See, the bodily resurrection of Christ, it validates, it confirms, or it proves that Christ's payment for our sin was accepted by our Heavenly Father, which resulted in our being restored or us being re reconciled to Him. And once again, we have gained a right standing with Him. But because, because we've missed our mark beforehand, before, because we've all sinned, we've missed that mark of perfection, it says that the, the, the mind and the heart that is, that is sinful and is not reconciled back to God is hostile to Him. And therefore, we are objects of His wrath. We are, in other words, if we can say it, even though we may never have thought of ourselves this way, we are enemies of him. But when Jesus paid that penalty when he rose, it says that he reconciled us and he puts us back into right standing. That's great news, my friends. No longer objects of God's wrath. So let me go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and two sections out of this chapter here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are what? If you hold firmly to what the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as first importance, that Christ, Christ, that Christ, come on now, that Christ, for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was what? Buried. And that he was what? Buried. On the third day, according to scripture. Now go down to verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Go down to 16. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile. You are in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But verse 20, but indeed, Christ has indeed raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. See, we have to understand that the, the resurrection is irreplaceable. Because if there is no resurrection, as Paul says here, then we're all fooling ourselves by being here this morning. And it'd be better for us just to have slept in this morning and watch the morning news shows. Letter B. The resurrection validates Christ has power over both sin and death. The resurrection validates Christ has power over both sin and death. Now we say that the Bible says that, that, with, that the payment of our missing God's standard of perfection was death. And we also believe that Jesus rescues us from that wage. And this is where the resurrection becomes important. If Jesus is simply going to die in my place, then what's the need of Jesus? Because you know what? I could have simply died. If death was all that mattered, if he was going to redeem us, if all it took was to redeem us from our curse was simply the death, then death, the death of Jesus was not necessary because I could just simply die. But do you not see and understand but that our simple death is only what we deserve and receive because of our sinfulness and missing God's standard, that it does not redeem us and it does not take us beyond that? It does not restore us. It just simply, this is the punishment which you must, that is meted out before you because of your, your, your not recognizing the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. The 
by Jesus dying for me and not remaining in the grave, but then coming out of the grave on the third day in the morning, on Sunday morning, which we celebrate today, shows us and demonstrates to us that Jesus just didn't simply pay the penalty for our sin. He conquered our sin. Come on now. For if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then he could not overcome the consequence of sin. And therefore, sin had power over him. But Christ did rise from the dead, and he did conquer sin and death. And we now have a hope of salvation because God accepted Christ's sacrifice and raised him from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, or 15, verse 26 says, The last enemy, enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is humanity's final enemy. Every one of us, every one of us is appointed once to die and then to face what? Judgment. The only way that death can be conquered is by resurrection. And Jesus accomplished, accomplished that, amen. John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from the father. How many people have claimed, you know, you kill me and I'm going to rise again. We've had all these wacko jobs out there in these cults that have said, you know what, I'm going to resurrect from the dead. And you know what, what do we find about them all? None of them have resurrected. You know, and many times, you know, we, we, we wrestle with that question, you know, who killed Jesus and whatnot. You know, nobody killed Jesus. What does this verse say? Jesus laid his life down. Jesus gave up his life. And you know what? Here's the thing. Is that not only did he lay down his life and what a sacrifice and what, 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 a, what, a, what, a, what a effort and, and what a demonstration of his love for us that he would lay down his life. Which many of us would do, you know, for anybody that we love. We, we would lay down our life for somebody that we love. But the difference is, is that if we lay down our life, we are dead. Jesus laid down his life, and he had the power to take it up again. Demonstrating then that he was not under the, the, under the conviction or under the power of sin and the, and the power of death in the grave, but he overcome it, for he was victorious and had power over it. Amen, my friends. Amen. Letter C is that it validates that Jesus is our intercession intercessor. Romans chapter 8 verse 34, Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20, where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf, he has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Basically these passages are saying that right now that Jesus is no longer here, but he's where? He's at the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing? He's interceding for who? Yes. How can he do that if he's dead? How can he do it if he's dead? He can't do it if he's dead. So if the Bible says that he's doing it and he's not dead, then it means he has to be what? So it validates, and the resurrection validates what, his, what, the, what the Bible describes as his role of what he is accomplishing right now on our behalf. As he's reconciled us, he's taken us from that place of judgment. He's taken us from, us from that place of being an enemy of God. He's reconciled us to him. And now he says, you know what? I'm going to be up here. I'm watching over you. I'm with you. I've sent my Holy Spirit to you. And you know what? And now I'm ever interceding on your behalf. And he can do that, my friend, because Jesus is not dead. He is alive. It validates, letter D, is it validates that he's coming again. As Christians, we often talk about hope, of having a blessed hope. And what is that blessed hope that we always talk about? That Jesus is coming again. John, chapter 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, what? Come back and take you to be with me so that you, where, that you also may be where I am. Acts chapter 9 through 11. And after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. 
and they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. In other words, we have the promise. Jesus said it, the angel said it, that he is coming back. And if he is coming back, it means that he is not dead. It means he is truly risen. He is at the right hand of the Father, praying on our behalf. And when the Father blows the trumpet, he's going to come on our behalf and he's going to return for us and take us home. The power and the beauty of the resurrection, my friends, it is irreplaceable. Letter E is that it validates that Jesus can reconcile us back to God. John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. I love that verse. How many of you in here can say, I'm a new creation? Amen. Amen. Tell your neighbor, I'm a new creation. Hallelujah. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, and though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I implore you today with the reading of that very verse, I would implore each and every one of you, I would beg, I would plead with everyone, every one of you this morning, would you be reconciled with God? Would you be reconciled back into him? No longer, no longer try to do it by your own accord, by just simply trying to be a good person or let your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. Because my friends, you will never meet the standard of God's perfection. We are in need of a savior. And aren't you glad that salvation is here today? That he lives in us, that God is mighty to save, and he is here to redeem, and he is here because he has paid the price, because not only has he died, but he has risen, and he is able to do and to accomplish what he said he would do and what he would accomplish. So the resurrection, it validates that Jesus is our healer. Jesus was often asked about his authority to do things. And he once said, which is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk? And he goes, to show you that I have the authority to forgive sins, I will say, pick up your mat and go home. If Jesus has the power over death, then surely he has the power over our diseases. Amen. Jesus and he fell on his knees and he begged 
Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus, it says, and Jesus, being filled with compassion, reached out his hand and said, I am willing, be clean. And at that moment, the healing water, the Holy Spirit began to flow, and that man who was filled with leprosy was cured. What is your need today? Is it a back problem? Do you have a liver problem? Do you have an eye problem? Is it cancer? I'm here to tell you today that cancer is just a word to my God and that my Jesus is willing. Come, come let us now and let's enter into that healing flow of the Holy Spirit. For my Jesus, my Jesus, my Jesus is willing. In heaven's rain, lift your heads, let us return to the mercy seat where time began, and in your eyes, I see the pain. Come soak this dry heart with healing rain. You hold my every moment. You call my raging sea. You walk with me. Daughter, your faith has healed you. up your map and walk. stone away. Lazarus, come forth.
for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, you are healed. So my friends, do not underestimate, do not underestimate, my friends, the necessity, the beauty, and the power of the resurrection. The final point that I want us to just discuss here just for a quick moment is letter G. It is the resurrection of Christ validates our victory in Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 and 57. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My friends, our faith is well-placed in Christ, and I'm here to tell you today that he is still in the life-changing business. And this room is filled with people who can say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Behold, I am a new creation, that he has changed me, that he has given me the victory over addictions and, and sins and, and things and bondages that have held me in bondage of all my life, and he has set us free. And I'm here to tell you today that he is the bondage breaker here today, and we have victory in him victory over sin and death. That, my friends, is the power of a risen Savior. And this morning, as part of our celebration this morning, we wanted to celebrate. We wanted to celebrate with those that would like to say this morning that they have found a victory in Jesus. And so what we're going to do here, we're going to close out our Easter service this morning with a baptism service. And we're going to celebrate the victory of Jesus in, the, in, in, the, in people's lives and what he has done. And let me tell you here today, my friends, what he has done in their lives, he can do in your life. And I'd ask you just to open up your ears this morning and that you would hear from them and hear their story. And would you hear it as it validates what we've already said? The resurrection validates everything. Amen. Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning, that I repented of my sin and won the victory. Sing with us. Oh, victory. 
And we are excited that you're here. And this is, I think, what this is an important bit that we need to draw in. I just want to just take a moment here and just explain what it is that we're about to do. That water baptism, we do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, Jesus was baptized. You read that in the gospel. We also know that Jesus commanded us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we baptize people for two reasons. Number one, to follow Christ's example. And number two is to be obedient to his commandments. Now, water baptism is not salvation. It does not save you. Okay? It does not wash away your sins, which is what most people think. It washes away your sins. It does not in and of itself. But it becomes a of what Jesus has done in your life. Remember we said the wage of our sin is death. And Jesus died on the cross for our sin. And after he died, they picked him up the cross and they did what? They buried him. And then three days later, Jesus what? He's no longer dead, but he rose again. And so what we have here, as we talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that in Christ, whoever's in Christ, that they are new creations. They are not the old saying, the old person they once were. The old is gone. Romans chapter 6, Philippians chapter 3 tell us that it is no longer I that live, but it is Christ that lives within us. Romans 6 tells us that you know what? When Jesus died, we died. When he rose, he rose. And so water baptism becomes a picture of that resurrection, that life. So when somebody comes walking down into this water in which I stand, it, when they come walking down, it represents their life before Christ. It represents them in all their bondages and their fears and their addiction and all the things that they've ever done wrong. And as we put them under water, it represents their dying with Christ. And aren't you glad that when we, when we put them under the water, we don't just leave them? I, th I told Tiffany that when she does it, she can hold them down to the count of ten, and after that she has to bring them up. <laughs> However, we don't leave them there because aren't you glad that Jesus is no longer dead? And when he rose from the dead, we rose with him, and now the life in which we live, though we live this life, it is no longer our life, but it's this life that Christ lives within us, the power of the victory of his cross and his resurrection. Amen. So today we have four individuals who can be, uh, be baptized Tiffany, our youth director, is going to be baptizing them, so I'm going to invite her to come down and join me. And my friends, let us celebrate together this morning. You lied about the temperature of this water, Pastor. And I love Baptism Sunday, and I love Easter Sunday, so it's like... invited me
inside of the Masons. So you see how it's a progression, it's a ripple, you know, and so it all goes back, you know, to, to not even Pastor Neil, but whoever died Pastor Neil, you know, and it's just, we continue to spread the gospel this way. And Connor actually started out Fusion Kids. Shout out to Fusion Kids. And, uh, and uh, so quiet, so shy, but then he came up with the aftershock and just unleashed the crazy side of it. It was awesome. But love Connor, full of questions. No one has more questions Thank you. God's changed my life a lot. This is a pretty bad, crazy thing. It's a pretty hectic life. Maybe change a lot. But I have to do it. 
know. I know if I can change. challenge you. What Christ has done for these people today, He can do in your life as well. You know, as I look across the room, there's a lot of faces that I don't I, I don't recognize or I've not talked to in person. And you know, and if you just give me two minutes here, it, 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 it would behoove you for me to do this. The resurrection means everything because it validates all the claims of what Jesus claims to be. He is our victory. He has given us that victory over sin and our death wants to make you into something Just as Justin and Hannah and Connor and McKenzie have all testified that they are different people, Christ wants to do that as well. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that life is perfect. It means that in Him, we live in His strength, not in our own. That we're never alone, and we are never without hope. My friends, I know that this world could use a whole lot of hope. And that hope is ultimately Savior Jesus Christ. And if you don't have any, if you don't have that hope and you don't have that life in which these people talk about what we talked about this morning, then I would ask you today, if you would like to know that, would you ask Christ into your heart today? Would you receive that gift of salvation which you've given? If you'd say, Pastor Keith, I want to do that because I want to know that life and that victory which these people describe. There's no shame in it, but I'm just going to ask you if you just raise your hand. Is there anybody in this room this morning? Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for who and what you are. I thank you for the hope and the victory that we have upon you today. I lift up every person here today. I thank you that you are alive, and I pray that you would just reveal yourself to them as a risen Savior. And I rejoice in you today. Bless them and keep them, and may your face shine upon them. And may you bless everything they put their hand to. Glory to you, in Jesus' name. Amen.
In our closing, I would invite us, if we would sing the great hymn of the church together about the resurrection. If you would join us, and after this song, you may be dismissed. If, uh, if you would close the screen here, guys, so they can see the words. And God bless you guys. I serve a risen Savior in the world, the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. At just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how. with me and talks with me along like they're away. He lives, he lives, salvation to Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. The Father is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along like narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to Him. bless you. Have a Merry Easter.